This is one chapter of a two-hour and 38-minute DVD production featuring the SP and Santa Fe roads in Tehachapi and Cajon Pass and connecting areas. Let's drop into the 1960s with the Santa Fe in Cajon Pass for some beautiful Alco PAs to lead off. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe by itself consisted of 11,000 route miles in 1989, it was ranked sixth in North America. The Santa Fe went no further than Richmond, California. It had a line running on down a few more miles to Emeryville, but that was pulled up by 1979. Richmond was once a place that built thousands of ships for World War II, and there were many other industries, such as automaking and oil refining, to bring jobs, workers, and trains. The two other roads in this region were SP and the Western Pacific. Santa Fe trains from this busy Bay Area port head due east and turn south at Stockton, California to head down to the San Joaquin Valley and to Bakersfield. Bakersfield to Santa Fe is a paying guest on SP's Tehachapi tracks until Mojave, where they move back on their own rails. If you look at the old Santa Fe employees' timetable, the rule book used on Tehachapi was SP's. The power here in these late 1970s views seems to be all EMD. At this time, some of the road crews complained that all the good power was assigned to the other subdivisions and the Stockton subdivision was given the leftovers. This is also one of the mildest places to run trains, adding to that thought. These beautiful rolling hills are on the west portal side of a tunnel, with our next two trains heading into Richmond and the end of the run. These tunnels were eventually modified and notched to allow double stack operation through beautiful Franklin Canyon. This is the east portal side of the tunnel, with a springtime local followed by a summertime train.
Let's look at how the Santa Fe ran trains after they ran down to Bakersfield and after using SP tracks to Mojave where they went from there. From Mojave the Santa Fe ran east to Barstow. From Barstow the Santa Fe in yellow could run east all the way to Chicago or south down to Los Angeles by 1887 and as far south as San Diego near the Mexican border. The Santa Fe made its Southern California connection through a line they built through Cajon Pass. We'll visit Cajon Pass and see lots of Santa Fe back in the 1960s, because in a way, Cajon Pass is really another part of the Tehachapi story. Everything in and out of Southern California on the Santa Fe system went through Cajon Pass. This is back in an era when the Santa Fe not only ran some of the finest passenger trains, but also mail trains. Carrying the mail and even sorting it on board, plus hauling parcels for the Railway Express Agency, helped offset the losses involved with passenger trains in general. First, the mail contracts were lost one at a time, and eventually the Railway Express Agency business withered and died. Without this type of business, the passenger trains became a terrible financial burden to railroads in general. This mail train is heading to LA by way of Pasadena. This line was torn up and replaced with an electric light rail system years later. Mail trains didn't attract many paying passengers. Only one rider coach is tacked on the rear of this train. Usually only railroad employees deadheading to other locations used these cars. Santa Fe tracks here are in yellow and SP is in orange. The old Santa Fe Pasadena subdivision wound up going to San Bernardino. The other main line ran through Fullerton to reach San Bernardino via Colton, where the SP Sunset lines were crossed. From there, the Santa Fe tracks, in blue, headed Compass North to Cajon Pass. This is where the Santa Fe crossed the SP in Colton, California. This local, led by a GP7 and followed by an F unit, is headed toward Fullerton. F7248-C was built in 1951 and finally retired in 1973. If you notice a number of Great Northern cars in Santa Fe trains, it was often from traffic routed down the inside gateway in partnership with Western Pacific and the Great Northern. The caboose on the end is 554-R. The R indicates a VHF, or very high frequency, radio on board. San Bernardino was a major Southern California yard for the Santa Fe.
Here, a Santa Fe eastbound, led by a U-36C and a U-30CG, has left San Bernardino and heads through Devore on the way up to Cajon Pass. The next train will be a westbound near Blue Cut. The blue lines are Santa Fe's two tracks through the pass. The red is SP's single track line added by 1967. We'll head up to the summit and see some great vintage Santa Fe material from a captivating era that will never be duplicated. The next scene will bring a trio of the 900 class of SD-24s from an order to EMD in 1959 for 80 units. The SD-24s made good mountain units and the Santa Fe would eventually upgrade them as SD-26s adding more horsepower. The trailing unit is an Alco RSD-15. Santa Fe had better luck with Alco products compared to the SP. Four SD-24s amount to 9,600 total horsepower and 388,000 pounds of starting tractive effort. The two helpers we just saw going down on the steeper south track are now on the back of this north track eastbound. At the Cajon summit we find a westbound led by an SD-24 and an Alco RSD-15 behind it smoking it up as they crest the summit and prepare for the downhill run. last unit is the most modern, a 1965 built GP35. Santa Fe owned 161 of these. Behind this freight and waiting its westbound turn is a mail train behind four Alco passenger PA units. These are often cited as the most beautiful diesels ever, especially in Santa Fe colors. Santa Fe owned 44 of these 1946 vintage Alco diesels. Santa Fe owned 
590 F3, F7, and F9 units all together. Most were painted blue for freight use. The passenger version in the war bonnet colors was geared for higher speeds and equipped with steam boilers to support passenger car operation. The Santa Fe had a train order station at Cajon Summit. It had a living quarters for the operators that worked there. They had to know Morse code and type up written orders to hand to the trains as they rolled by. Check the rotating light on this F7 leading the El Capitan passenger train toward Los Angeles at breakfast time. Enough sand has been dropped on rails over the decades here for improving traction to build a giant beach resort. To keep grades below 3%, the Santa Fe, in blue, added a second and longer line by 1913, known as the North Track. This was for eastbound traffic and it brought easier 2.2% grades. It's a longer run to the summit by 2 miles as a result of all the added curvature. The longer run takes us past the famous rock formations at Sullivan's Curve. This is Cajon Junction where eastbounds split off to the north track around Solomon's Curve and head to the summit, as this light helper set will demonstrate. Notice that these former SD24s are now SD26s with better 645 series diesels and a general 1973 era rebuilding. At the same time they received new yellow bonnet paint, adding more yellow to the cab area. Downhill westbounds generally take the old original line. We'll spend some time just to watch some eastbound traffic on the north track.
Barstow is an important classification yard that was extended in the 1970s. We'll look back before that time to parts of the old configuration. Barstow was named after William Barstow Strong, the early president of the Santa Fe. When the SP originally owned this line, it was named for a California governor, Robert Waterman. bridge across the dry Mojave riverbed was Waterman Cutoff for the trains heading to Mojave and the Tehachapi Line. This was the west end of the old Barstow Yard and the location of the West Tower, now gone. This freight has come over the Tehachapi Pass and it arrived here from Mojave. When the yard was greatly expanded in the mid-1970s, this complete Y was added about three miles west of the old torn-up Waterman Cutoff. Remember that this is only the tip of the proverbial iceberg of this two-hour and 38-minute DVD of the late SP and Santa Fe roads, in all the right places. Visit cspmovies.com for this and many other DVD productions. And thanks for watching.